very useful and very interesting discussions and great papers so far on many different topics and many different areas of uh, digital humanities, some methodological focused and some more content based. Our next speaker is Jonas muller lachmann from Freie Universität in Berlin. And his title is Challenges in Working with Arabic Script, Speech and Representation. So Jonas, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm gonna talk a bit about Arabic vernacular poetry, uh, which was part of my PhD and uh, yeah, the challenges that come when working with it. So uh, first of all, my research data is important to understand when it comes to the issues. Uh, I worked on Arabic vernacular poetry uh, that was created by nomadic and semi-nomadic internees during and after their internment in Italian concentration camps in Libya Coloniale in the late 1920s and 1930s. Um, and the research project was to read this poems, uh, these poems as subjective voices of internees because they were yet only addressed as reports on what happened in the concentration camps um, like as historical sources. Uh, I really wanted to address how they dealt with their being in a traumatizing env uh, environment in the context of Arabic poetry traditions, uh, as I said, to highlight the subjective the subjectivity uh, in this poetry. Um, there were indeed some problems with the sources as well with, this, with the language. Um, the source material was, uh, well, the original mode was unknown. Uh, it's presumable oral uh, in most cases, uh, but not in all. Uh, it was collected as part of a national narrative building process in the Jamahariya, which was the uh, republic form of uh, Gaddafi. And uh, thus it was collected like with a political ambition. Um, it was transcribed in non-vocalized Arabic script, which, which, uh, which is a big issue. And only parts of the material published had been, uh, of the material had been published, uh, but even that was in bad editing quality um, and there was no, um, editing guideline uh, whatsoever. Uh, furthermore, no digital copies or open access archives exist uh, and there's civil war or was civil war. Uh, that was also a thing. And when it gets to the language, there is the ever existing problem with Arabic script. It's an impure abjad, so a consonant alphabet. Um, which has some long vowel signs, uh, but only optional vowel diacritics. Um, so not all vowels are written. Uh, it is written from right to left and it consists of letters with mostly contextual letter forms, which is a problem, especially in an uh, RTL environment. Uh, it is a highly inflected language and it can, it can be transcribed in Latin script theoretically, but the system and uh, uh, how to transcribe it, that depends on the language you want to transcribe and the language you transcribe to. For example, the British system is a different from the from the German one. Um, I encoded the poems in TEI because it is well documented and extensive standard. It is highly interoperable and I wanted to have it interoperable and uh, sustainable because in case I want to continue on that uh, in the future, I wanted to have it uh, ready to use. Uh, XML can be simply stored as files or ingested in an XML database without further transformation or querying. I didn't want to have to set up uh, some kind of backend for using the data. Uh, it offers the option to embed CMF, which is the correspondence metadata interchange format to the header, header of some of the poems that were sent as letters to um, like have the opportunity to uh, use network analysis or correspondence analysis. And in the end, I also just like it. I like um, the opportunities that come with TI. But there also are also issues with TI or XML in general. It's an RTL script and um, it's an LTR script and uh, using RTL script in LTR environments is pain in the ass. There is no dedicated support for oral or semi-oral Arabic in general. And thus there's no dedicated support for the specifics of Arabic poetry because that is mostly oral um, or has at least um, like oral performativity. Uh, thus, there was no or there is no dedicated support for the specifics of my sources whatsoever. So how to deal with it? I split every poem in three parts. Uh, I had one TEI file for the Arabic original, which I more or less just left there. 
Um, I had one for the translation, which I used for encoding rhetorics. And uh, I planned to do one for the transcription um, for an easier encoding for language specifics. Um, but that I skipped because transcription, as I will um, talk about uh, soon, is kind of a problem. So there are several issues with this uh, methodology and uh, with the situation. First of all, as I hinted towards, there are technical issues. There is no problem, uh, proper RTL, LTR support in open source IDEs. Although there is in some, it's not really enough for uh, complex encodings in uh, XML. Um, as I said, RTL in an XML LTR environment is difficult, um, which leads to complex encoding, for example, of the morphology renders text almost illegible for humans and makes it extremely prone to encoding errors because you cannot simply navigate the file anymore. Um, not speaking of understanding what you're doing. There are language related issues. The pronunciation and thus information on oral performativity is not represented in Arabic script because it's a consonant alphabet. And although people who can speak Arabic or read Arabic are able to read it, there's no certainty in uh, how it's re read, especially when you deal with a, uh, with a dialectal um, script. Also, there's this bad editing quality with a lot of mistakes that were more obvious sometimes, but sometimes you didn't really know if it's a mistake or just a dialectal, uh, like a, a dialect word. Um, so that makes it even worse. And uh, due to the poem's long transmission from being originated in or directly after the camp, then uh, like like was was told between the the people, then collected by this archive, uh, recorded from the recording. It was uh, transcribed in Arabic script. Then it was uh, published, and then I took the published material and uh, worked on that. So that that's quite a way. And also, what's about epistemic violence in my case, because despite me, white European non-native speaker of Arabic, not speaking of uh, Arabic Libyan dialect from the 1930s and 1920s rurally, uh, working on a data set of bad quality in a field that is mostly unknown yet highly disputed, challenging the way in which this poetry was addressed in Libyan nationalist orators, and still is by some scholars with strong opinions often, uh, using Latin script-based IDEs and markup languages in general, uh, and in general, Latin script-based infrastructure that fails to address the specifics of Arabic. So there's already a lot there. The transcription and the translation is, of course, a problem because my analysis is mainly based on that because it's a workaround and has some kind of scriptural coloniality in it. And the ambiguity of the Arabic text um, itself being a transcript of the oral sources uh, makes it worse. Also, the loss of information, um, as I said, the availability uh, of the sources, the transmission, uh, that it's written in the Najat, uh, transcription, translation, limited language skills may lead to false presumptions, interpretations, and thus also misconceptions of representability. Um, also, on the side of technical issues, some are more or less, uh, there is no proper support and IDEs require, uh, and so it is required to um, develop uh, Latin script-based workarounds um, or a strong will to suffer. And uh, in the end, Arabic script remains marginalized in digital humanities uh, or computational studies, um, even more so dialectal representations. As we saw with the Syriac uh, presentation earlier, there is um, something happening in the field, um, but it's mostly um, focused on, um, like on manuscript studies and not so much on modern um, modern material. Um, some people told me some things to like improve my situations. For example, why not use solutions like OpenRTI Markdown? Well, for, first of all, it's again not meant to uh, provide um, script for uh, encoding modern sources. Also, I find it less intuitive and readable than XML. Um, there is not really a stack related community because there are only some people developing this, mainly one. Uh, it is not meant to be a comprehensive standard, but that was something I wanted to have. 
And it is yet another Latin script based workaround solution. So not really a solution to the problem that I want to find alternatives for Latin based uh, Latin script based workaround. And in terms of IDE support, I got the suggestion to just use gedit because it has such a nice RTL support. Gedit is an operating system and Wunder manager specific text editor with a good coding support, but it's not a full stack IDE, which is what I wanted to have. Uh, it doesn't really work on Mac OS, at least not reliably. And I think um, if we talk about fair principles, interoperability and sustainability and that things, um, I think if we want the data to be interoperable, so should be the IDE and the software that we use. And you shouldn't have to struggle with uh, using different OS. So where to go from here? Um, yeah, in general, are there better pragmatic approaches for a case like mine? Do you have any ideas you want to uh, present or you want to talk about, you want to discuss? How to improve, and the next is more like a uh, political one, how to improve NLS support in XML? Uh, maybe there would be an idea to, uh, to provide a special interest group uh, at the TEI for SWANA NLS. Maybe that would help. Um, but even if that would be an opportunity to improve the situation, um, how to deal with the stack and infrastructure related issues of epistemic violence, that is, I think, much more difficult to improve, um, at least as the situation is like it is. Uh, and like also primarily how to deal with the IDE situation. Are there any IDEs or, I mean, is there any opportunity to improve um, IDEs? Like, besides uh, in these small step plugin levels. So that's from me. Um, thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, I just wrote three uh, projects here that are recently, um, that were recently founded in Berlin. So there's something going on here to try to address these issues, but it's more like a, on a German level. So maybe not that much of an interest for you just to show we're trying to to get hold of the issues thank you thanks jonas and uh, excellent timing as well uh, so thank you for that um, yeah it's it's very interesting what you say and the way that you framed the uh, methodological issues that have arisen during your research, but also the way that you uh, decided to solve them based on this criteria of operability of the software. It's not easy and a lot of times we have to uh, make decisions based on the software available, right? Um, so this was very interesting, especially when it comes to the systems talking to each other and you raise the possibility also of a special interest group, perhaps. Um, I don't know what kind of uh, interest has been you've been able to gauge not just um, you know up until now or you know from other people also working on Arabic related scripts and things so this is also uh, worth discussing and exploring uh, so if people have questions then please uh, raise your hand or you can type them in the chat so, um, you also mentioned the uh, oh, somebody yeah uh, Simon please Thanks for a very interesting talk, Janis. Uh, I wanted to ask how deep you want to go in your questioning about epistemic violence. Is even an operating system an instance of epistemic violence when you're dealing with data of this kind? I think that depends on where you want to go, because I, I think there are also always two sides uh, in this discussion, the, the like theoretical political one and the pragmatic one. And I think on the theoretical side, you have to address the problem of epistemic violence also in case of the US. Um, however, on a pragmatic approach, I think um, that's far too deep because in the end you want to get out, go on working. And I think if you begin to discuss uh, operating systems, maybe um, you will like not have enough time for that. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea and that should be addressed, but I think more on the theoretical uh, discussion level first, at least. Thank you. Other questions? 
Yeah, I've got, or well, it's sort of an observation, um, I guess, a bit more than a direct question, but that I think you, you really highlighted well the, the challenges of um, doing digital humanities when no one else has much worked on something. And I know when I was sort of, you know, like so many people, I, I learned a lot of the methodologies myself. I sort of upskilled it wasn't something I was taught formally. And that I would follow tutorials that would explain, you know, TEI or, or GIS, which I used as well. And they would work perfectly on that really nice curated well-formed data set and then when I moved it back to the stuff I was working on which no one else was working on it would be a real you know a real struggle um, and I think it's yeah I think it, doing all that that groundwork is 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 really valuable but can be yeah perhaps a struggle in digital humanities it's not always addressed maybe as much as we need to. I think it's a struggle both in digital humanities as well as in Arabic studies because in Arabic studies or like especially in that area of Arabic studies. Um, digital humanities is not that much of a thing and people are very envious uh, when it comes to publishing their data. Um, and in digital humanities, as I said, the Arabic studies part of digital humanities is mainly manuscript studies. And um, there's not yet so much going on in terms of modern uh, topics. Mm. Especially not with orality as an issue. Mm. I think you really, um, I mean, it, things that struck me about it, it it's such a big, <laughs> you know, on, over here we've got epistemic violence and then over here there's the TI issues and it's such a big kind of world that you're trying to do battle with here, Jonas, and it's really fascinating. I mean, for me, I think one of the main things that you, like on one hand, it seems very simple because you're kind of taking a corpus of manuscripts that are you know oral in nature and trying to apply a digital you know methodology to them trying to transform them into digital content on the other hand you've you've been able to show very successfully and very efficiently i think in the presentation how you quickly run into these kind of issues you know methodological issues and i'm finding the same thing with my work as well that looks at kind of renaissance texts that if you have, um, it's kind of going back to what Quinn was saying before, as, as you mentioned, you know, if you don't work on a language like English or that's well resourced, then it's just increasingly difficult to come to these decisions yourself in a way, especially if they're not, you know, strict Arabic or strict Italian or strict whatever, whatever strict means. Um, and then you have to try to figure out how best to represent this language in a digital context. I mean, they're, they're poems, they're, they're oral in it, they're, it's, a, it's somebody's language, right, that, who they've written down. So you kind of think, unless you, you do have a special interest group and you get help from multiple people, it's basically impossible to kind of do it by yourself because it just becomes too overwhelming. So I don't know if you, I mean, you mentioned how Arabic, I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid, but I wonder if there are, um, you know, not even just Arabic, other centers out there who are working on Semitic linguistics or um, similar, like maybe the chronological period is similar or something who have been able to be helpful for you or have you kind of investigated and they're not helpful at all? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, the sole project, like in the end, is a trade-off. I really had to, at a certain point, say, okay, I, I don't go further this road. Uh, so in the end, the PhD project remained to be a rather conservative uh, research project instead of being a, a digitally uh, supported project. So I just uh, encoded the data for possible future research. Um, so uh, I mainly remained on uh, like conservative research uh, method and uh, the contact to Libyan native speakers, although them had issues with the language. Um, because this is such an obscure dialect that was spoken in that time in that area. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think um, there are um, many people trying to, to get hold on this problem. Um, there are initiatives, uh, like for example, the Islamicate Digital Humanities Network. Um, they try to bring together like scholars, not only from uh, like Europe and the US, uh, but also like scholars from 
the Swana uh, countries or from South America or from countries where you wouldn't typically look for Arabic studies mm -hmm. scholars, which is mm -hmm. itself uh, like a thing with like where you yeah. had to thought about uh, epistemic violence. Yeah. Um, so there are, um, well, there are uh, projects that try to deal with the top with these issues. Um, but I think they are very fragmented. That's the problem. Uh, many scholars, I think, don't know of others who deal with this. Uh, the, many projects, many initiatives don't know of each other, or maybe they met once or they had a meeting or a conference, but then again, they go their way. And uh, so there's not that much mm. um, unity or common ground, yeah. uh, which is, I think, a problem in dealing with this. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are people trying to uh, address these issues. Yeah, no, I, you know, the, I guess these are the kind of fora where you want to be able to meet and uh, connect with other scholars. So, no, it was very interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Jonas, very much. This was a great uh, presentation. Uh, I think we should move on uh, to Daniele now. Thank you. Um, this is a paper presented by Diana Fabiola Travala Royas and Daniele Sorato uh, with uh, Lidon Haraide and Knut Hofland as well. Um, so Daniele, over to you. I can see your slides perfectly. Okay, good. Um, so uh, hello everyone. Um, today I'll present to you the multilingual corpus of survey questionnaires or MCSQ for short. And um, the MCSQ is the first publicly available corpus of survey questionnaires. It's currently in, his, uh, in its third version, named uh, Rosalind Franklin, and it encompassed 306 distinct dis uh, questionnaires sorry, from the European Social Survey, the European Value Study, the Survey of Health, Aging, and Retirement in Europe, and the Wage Indicator Survey. Um, in case you're not uh, familiar with the survey area, these are very large scale um, uh, cross-national survey projects. And they have the objective of uh, measuring the opinion and attitudes of uh, people regarding some relevant um, social areas, such as um, attitudes uh, concerning immigration, um, trust in democracy, uh, climate change, and these kinds of topics. Um, so the third version, as I said, it encompasses these 306 um, questionnaires, and that comprises more than 4 million words and approximately 766,000 sentences. Um, this corpus is uh, open access. Uh, all the data and the code that I did to compile it is available. It is uh, searchable. It's sentence aligned and with respect to the source, which is English. And it's also automatically annotated with uh, post-tagging and name identity recognition annotations. Um, so these questionnaires um, are originally produced in English, localized for uh, the Great Britain. And then they are translated to several languages for the purpose of cross-national analysis, right? Um, in the MCSQ, we only have um, eight uh, translations, uh, to, translations to eight languages, sorry. So this would be Catalan, French, uh, Czech, German, Norwegian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian. And we also have, um, well, here it says language varieties, but it's more like um, a country adaptation. So for instance, um, we have questionnaires in French, but some of them are localized for France, so some of them for Switzerland, and so on. Um, the questionnaires uh, and the translations in the MECSQ follow the, the ask the same question method. And this is a method uh, where any translation is expected to produce texts that are functionally equivalent for the purpose of statistic analysis. 
right? So um, the questions that are contained in the, the questionnaires and their translations, uh, they are not uh, just translations, they are um, statistical instruments. So in order to reduce the measurement errors and allow for uh, good quality cross-national uh, statistical analysis, it's necessary to ensure that uh, the questions are really measuring the same uh, psychological variables. That is, that they really measure the same opinions and attitudes across languages. Um, and that is really important because uh, low quality translations, they really hamper the data the comparability and decrease the measurement errors. So um, other than the texts of the questionnaires themselves, we have a lot of metadata. Some of them, um, some of the metadata is very interesting. For instance, uh, we have a type of metadata that's called it in type, which represents the, um, the role that a sentence has um, in, the, in the question. So for instance, in green, you can see an introduction to a question and which says, and now a few questions about your life. Then we, uh, you can see some instructions uh, in pink. There are instructions to the interviewer and also to the person being interviewed. Uh, so for instance, show card 18, which is the first instruction should be an instruction for the interviewer and the other one for the people that's being interviewed. But we make uh, no distinction between these types of instructions in the corpus, they are just instructions. Um, in blue, you can see uh, the question itself, uh, taking all things together, how happy would say you are. And then uh, you have the responses um, in purple. In this case, the response is a scale that goes from zero to 10 and the person being interviewed should uh, answer this question using this case. Um, as I commented in the beginning, the, the corpus is also sentence aligned in respect to the source, that is the, the English text. And uh, I did a special uh, sentence alignment algorithm for this uh, project. Um, I tried to use a common um, off the shelf um, sentence alignment algorithms, but they didn't work so well in this type of data that we have. And then um, I developed a metadata where um, sentence alignment algorithm. And the way it works is that uh, firstly, um, the algorithm filters the, the questions by their, um, the names of the questions. So for instance, uh, this question name is C1. And so we ensure that only really the, the same questions are aligned together. Um, then we filter the, the, the questions in, uh, by the intent type. So only the same um, sentences with the same meeting type should be aligned together. So here in this, um, in this image, you can see, for instance, the introduction of the, the, the English source uh, questionnaire is aligned with the introduction of um, a Catalan questionnaire. And you can see that, um, yeah, only sentences with the same type go together. So instructions go with instructions, uh, questions with questions, and so on. And uh, having the sentence alignment uh, information is um, quite good because that also allows for the creation of uh, translation memories. Uh, which is something we actually have support uh, um, support for building translation memories in the interface uh, that is also specialized for this corpus. So um, yeah, having the sentence alignment information allows us to do this. So to sum up, uh, the MCSQ is an open source and, sorry, just a second. I'm really sorry about that. 
Um, so the MCSQ is an open source and open access um, corpus that follows the FAIR principles that is uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reprodu reproducible. Uh, the data is freely available in the Clarino repository. You can uh, download the data in this uh, link that is right here. And also the corpus and all its metadata are available for both uh, visualization and downloading through the MCSQ interface. So that is the specialized interface that I uh, was telling you about. It is accessible through this link. The registration is free of charge. And it has, uh, it's quite simple, it's not uh, pretty because I did it myself and I have uh, no experience whatsoever in designing interfaces. Uh, but it has some interesting functionalities such as this one of uh, customizing and creating your own uh, translation memories. You can uh, do word searches, compute frequencies, collocations, etc. And also all the code is available, as I said, uh, in my GitHub. Uh, so this first link would be for the code that I did to actually compile the, the, the corpus. Um, everything since pre-processing until uh, sentence alignment. And then uh, the MCSQ interface uh, is also available in this link. And that would be it. Thank you so much, Daniele. This is a very interesting uh, corpus and uh, very clear as well, the way you have presented uh, a big piece of infrastructure to see how people might use it, what kind of questions you've asked, um, like where you went about uh, assessing your data as well. So um, I wasn't aware of this uh, project or aware of these um, surveys and, the, and your database. So this is very interesting to me, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some minutes for questions, if people um, have anything they would like to ask or comments for Daniele as well. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that uh, you mentioned kind of word, uh, word searches are available, but also collocations. And I think this is the kind of uh, data that could be very helpful for people who are interested in cross European perspectives into things uh, like aged care or a host of other, um, you know, quality of life kind of indicators, since that seems to be the nature of the survey. But also, um, it allows you to kind of see the semantic differences as well between the languages in terms of how does a, uh, you know, the same question in a different language elicit potentially different responses uh, based on the, the nature of the words used, the, the lexis used essentially. Is that, is that true or is that not what, it's, what, what it could be used for? Yes, exactly. Uh, so what you're talking about is precisely uh, making sure that the questions are uh, functionally equ equivalent. And uh, that is, um, a big problem and actually for some countries that uh, are bilingual or speak more than uh, mm. two languages, that is a, a very huge problem and uh, because there are more uh, measurement errors related to that because, um, well, um, your native language is a uh, it, uh, it invokes different uh, visualizations of representations in your mind than other types of language. So sometimes if you apply a, a questionnaire in one language to someone in a country that is bilingual and doesn't, um, the native language is, does, is not actually that language of the questionnaire, it might uh, uh, have yeah. some, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think uh, even, you know, regardless of any discussion of diglossia or multilingualism in in a potential European country in other European countries, I think already just the framing of you know again it's going back to what we we're saying a bit at the start of the day in terms of having a standard language versus dialects and how people might react to those questions quite differently um, according to whichever variety of language is chosen. 
Uh, I think the data would be very interesting as well to see what kind of differences uh, might come up. So this is really this is really fascinating. Um, are there other questions or comments that people might have for Daniele? Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Do you know what P is it? I wasn't sure how new it was in terms of people actually engaging with it. Do you know if people researchers have engaged with it and what they're using it for at this stage? Well, um, so there are people that are using this corpus exactly for this uh, purpose that I mentioned um, to see across the... So uh, one thing that I missed saying is that uh, these questionnaires, they are applied every two years. Uh, so there is also these... Uh, factor of um, you can make an analysis about an opinion across the years. Mm. So there are some people uh, making sure that uh, the translations are kept the same across the years and across countries. And um, also there are people using these uh, data for building uh, translation models uh, for uh, is this specialized type of text, which is um, survey text. Mm. Mm. So these are uh, the, the two use cases that I'm aware of. Yeah, because you mentioned uh, Daniele as well, how the, you know, if it, there's this alignment that you've been able to um, operationalize in the program and that the software also kind of learns, it trains itself in a sense, if that's the way I understand correctly. So I'm wondering uh, how well it's doing that. If you are using the same questions, perhaps from year to year, or when it goes from one language to another. What, sorry, I didn't get your question. I, th I think you mentioned at one point in your presentation how the software is also training itself, mainly for the alignment, if that's right. Uh, so that it can automatically find the corresponding questions, I think, in different languages. So I was wondering if there's a way to measure the success or how well it's doing that or how well uh, it's working in that way. Well, um, so this sentence alignment strategy, it doesn't require training. Uh, it's basic on a simple heuristic. I use the only uh, the, the the well the ratio between the source and the in the target um, synthesis, as well as uh, some uh, automatically built uh, bilingual dictionaries uh, to make sure that I can find uh, the best um, candidate uh, for a given sentence. So what I do is uh, to use a lot of the metadata because we do have a lot of metadata regarding these questionnaires. And um, yeah, so that's how the, the, the algorithm works. And in order to, uh, to see how well it's doing, um, you have to have a gold standard to compare the, uh, someone that manually did the alignment and then compare it. And we did some golden standards uh, for three languages, which are French, Catalan, uh, no, French, Catalan, Spanish, and Portuguese. Yeah. So um, it's about the accuracy, it's uh, about 92% or something like that. So uh, okay. it, it's not perfect, but it, it's quite good yet. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you again, Daniele, for this presentation and for introducing us to this, um, to this research. It's, it's really great to hear about this. Uh, I think we can move from Europe to China and we also have uh, Lian Yu with us. And uh, sorry, Lian, just let me get up the title of your presentation. Uh, Lian is from Hubei University of Technology uh, and she will speak to us about a corpus-based study of China's national image in the English translations of government uh, reporting. Uh, Lian, do you have slides to share as well? Yeah, and I'll try to share. Just wait a minute. 
Sorry. That's okay. Take your time. Can you stay my screen? Yes, now we can. That looks good. I can okay. see the first slide. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for your introduction. And finally, it's me. I'm waiting so long in nervous. And the topic of my, uh, of my research today is a corpus based study of China's national image in the English versions of government reports. And my talk will be divided into four parts. In the first part, I will introduce the background and purpose of my research. And the motivation of this study is that the government re a report is one of the most authoritative documents of China, and it represents expresses the wishes of the country and people. It also makes contribution to the uh, construction of the national image and makes it possible for the international community to fully and objectively understand China and the Chinese government. And besides, the previous research was uh, mostly focused on the characteristics or changes of the government functions. However, in general, there is a lack of research um, conducted on the national image presented in the English versions of the government report, especially from the perspective of discourse analysis. So um, this research aims to describe the linguistic features of the English versions of the government reports from 2016 to 2021, and to analyze the uh, national image presented in this official document. And now let's move to the second section. The theoretical framework of, uh, of this research is critical discourse analysis. And it brings the critical tradition in social analysis into language studies and it contributes to critical uh, social analysis, a particular focus on discourse and the relations between discourse and other social elements, um, like powers, ideologies, institutions, and social identities, et cetera. And under this framework, we try to explore the self-shaping image of the Chinese government and of, of course the national image as well, um, presented by the English versions of the government report. And as for the uh, methodology part, um, a computer-based uh, corpus assisted approach was adopted in our research. Uh, with W metrics, we set up a corpus containing English versions of government report. It is a very powerful tool and software tool for corpus analysis and comparison. It also provides a web interface to English USAS class corpus annotation tool and uh, standard corpus uh, linguistic methodologies such as frequency lists and concordances. It also expands the keywords method to key grammatical categories and key semantic domains. And um, however, in our research, we just try to focus on part of the functions like the word frequency list analysis and keywords analysis. The reason why we choose to use is that um, it is convenient for us to conduct a large scale of discourse analysis. And by using this tool, here we try to address the following three questions. The first is what are the high frequency wor words? And second is that what social context do these words reflect? The last is what kind of national image do they present? So now let's come to the research findings. In this part, we just try to focus on the high frequency verbs, nouns, and keywords. And in general, the high frequency verbs uh, can reflect the actions um, performed frequently by the speaker. And the high frequency nouns and keywords can sometimes show the focus or topics of interest of the speaker. Here is the high frequency verbs and high frequency nouns and the keywords list. According to table one, and let's see, the English versions of the uh, government reports has used a large number of model verbs like, like will, you can see in the third line, ac accounting for more than 2% of the total words each year. And besides the number of the model verbs like must and should also made up a large proportion of the total. 
And here we can see the strong will and determination of the government trying to take measures to figure out the problems or just to do something for, for the society and the people. Um, besides verbs like improve, promote, strengthen, develop, increase, etc., all of this contain positive meanings. And according to the concordances of these verbs like develop a strong health system, increase people's income, strengthen policy support for rural areas, strengthen new drivers of development. From all above, we can see China's determination to ensure and improve people's well-being. It also reflects that China's um, positive and enterprising image in the process of promoting the national development. Additionally, I think it's obvious that many high frequency nouns, verbs, or keywords are in common during the six years, but we can still find some changes. Like according to the table three, the keywords, the number of insured po um, poverty, employment, support, all of this significantly increased in 2020. Why? Because I think the coronavirus really impacted us a lot. And according to the concordances, the words related to people's well-being, like living standards and employment, um, often occur together with insure. And, be and besides Hong Kong, Hubei, and enterprises, these words often appear after support. And from here, it can be concluded that under the pandemic, the Chinese government was highly um, concerned about Hong Kong's special administrative region and key areas, Hubei in the um, epidemic prevention and control and all walks of life across the country to safeguard people's livelihood. And here we can also see that China um, cares for the people, works for the people, and has a strong sense of responsibility, which can also reflect this people-oriented image. And finally, let's uh, come to the conclusion. And um, from the analysis of above, we can see that government is pragmatic and diligent and countries enterprising and promising with self-reliance and remaining effort. And it also has strong national go uh, governance capacity and sense of responsibility. And it gives priority to people's well-being. And, and last but not least, what I want to say is about the national image in the future research, because um, in our research, the national image was just concluded from the government report, or you can say it was concluded from the self-shaping uh, self perspective. So someone will think it is not objective enough to just draw a conclusion that China is a, a positive and enterprising or something. So I think it's, it's a great necessity to conduct research on some other types of discourse like the news reports or speeches, especially from other countries. And then maybe there will be a more comprehensive national image about, Ch about China. And here is the references. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Leanne. Well done. This is really fantastic to hear. and. Uh, very interesting research as well. Every topic seems to get more and more interesting as we're going along during today. So you've covered a lot of ground in 10 minutes, that's for sure. Uh, it's great to hear about the software that you've used, but also the way that you construct, uh, constructed the study and uh, the kind of results that you've been able to um, extract from the data as well. So that's really great. Uh, so questions for Leanne. I wonder about your corporate, I'm going to ask one if nobody else is going to ask one, because I wonder about the corpus, Leanne, because in one of the, in the second table of word frequencies, you had reform, which could be a noun or a verb, right? And so how was the computer able to pass the corpus in that way? Uh, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear your question. Yeah, it's in the second table of word frequency. So in the um, table with the noun yeah. frequencies, and then one of them, it's reform, I think. Yeah, reform. Uh, about halfway down. One, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth word, I think it is. It's a bit small on my screen to kind of see. Yeah. In 2020? 
Well, they're the same in, across every row, right? All or array. Is that right? Yeah. Or no. I just... know oh, they change. Yeah. In any case, one of the words there is reform. Yeah. So it, it's really just a question about how the computer is able to distinguish in such a large corpus between whether the word is a noun or a verb. Because it has a function like a part of speech and once you uh, load the text into the software and it will just, I think maybe it is artificially. Uh, okay, so the computer does that. You didn't make any decision or you didn't have to adjust. Load it up. Ah, okay, interesting. Thank you. Chak uh, Ming Lao, you have a question as well? Hi, uh, hi. Uh, just checking, like, uh, what software did you use for the uh, word segmentation and uh, part of speech tagging? Uh, did you use Jebba or something like that? Well, I, I use W Matrix. It was put forward by Grayson, a professor in Lancaster University. Oh, I see. I see. It's a software tool online. And very I powerful, see. I think. I just use part of the functions. Oh, I see. Uh, thanks. I'll check this out. Yeah, I think it's very popular, these kind of software now, especially for um, different types of part of speech tagging, but also Langsbox and W Matrix seems to be very popular as well, especially for corpus planning research. Um, maybe other people on this call have more um, experience with that, but yeah, I think it's a good good one to use. Uh, Chuck, did you have another question that you uh, wanted no. to ask? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the clarification, thank you. Okay, no further question. Yeah, I, I was curious, um, you mentioned it's sort of, uh, oh, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, that, um, you know, there was terms like in 2020 about things like poverty and, and concerns that were probably kind of from COVID, you know, because of the outbreak of, of COVID-19. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, there's also positive, um, you know, kind of a lot of positive terms, which I guess is, is never surprising in government documents that they would um, have. Have you done any or looked into doing any kind of sentiment analysis on this. I don't even know if that would be an appropriate approach to government reports, but I, yeah, I was just curious because they do, do seem to be these obvious positive, negative terms in, in some of it. I, I, I can <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, so with, I'm not sure if you've looked at this, but sentiment analysis where you look at the um, you know, sort of look at whether the texts are sort of positive, you know, showing something positively or showing something negatively. I was I'm partly interested, uh, one of our students at the ANU who was based in, in China because of COVID during her degree was looking at this on, on Weibo to see what, how people responded to government tweets about COVID, whether they responded positively or negatively. Um, to tweet, sorry, well, posts on Weber um, about COVID. So I was wondering, yeah, if you'd looked at, at analysing the government reports in terms of positivity, negativity, and whether it would be even a useful thing to do. Well, I just, uh, I just downloaded the government reports from the official website. And um, I was wondering whether you just asked uh, if I will just post something um, positive or negative on Weibo or, uh, or some social. Oh, no, I, I met I had a student who looked at that on Weibo. But yeah, I was wondering with with these reports, sort of what uh, I guess what other types of analysis you might you might do on them. Analysis, uh, other types of analysis uh, on them. Yeah. Um, actually, on um, I, I I do do some other research on this types of like discourse analysis, but I try to not focus on the government report. I try to do some research on the news reports, but not on Chinese, but not on Chinese Chinese reports. Like 
I will try to do uh, try to research, do some research, do some work in the American news about like the Chinese education, something some something else. And I'll try to just focus on Chinese government. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Thank you. I think I there's see, other questions. Yeah, I can see Simon has his hand up as well. Thanks for an interesting presentation, Leanne. Um, I wanted to ask whether you had considered doing the same kind of analysis on the original Chinese texts to see whether there's any subtle differences that creep in in kind of emphasis or shading when you go between languages, whether there's a, any attempt to present a different image to outsiders than to insiders. Is that something you'd thought about? Yeah, I think there is some difference between the, the between the self-shaping image and others shaping image. And in and in this research, I just focus on self a self shaping image because you know the government report is written by by Chinese by Chinese people. Yes, so, but written originally in Chinese, right? What? It's uh, written I, originally in Chinese. Originally in China. Uh, so you you ask why I I don't uh, conduct research on Chinese uh, report the government report right? I'm asking whether you thought about comparing, doing the same kind of analysis on the Chinese report as you've done on the English version to see whether there are any differences. Um, well, actually, I have seen some similar research that, uh, that they conduct research on the Chinese version of the government report. And, and, and I think this is the kind of research gap and no one, or I can say no one, there is a lack, lack of research that conducted on English versions of the government report. And you know, there, there are differences between the two languages, English and Chinese have difference. So like, um, so I think in the, the, usage of, uh, the usage of words may be different in the two versions of, gov of, uh, of government reports. And actually I, I, I'm a major of foreign language student. So, in my research, I just try to focus on English versions of the Chinese gov of the government reports. Okay, thank you. I was wondering the same thing. Yeah, these comparisons would be very interesting. So thank you for that question. And Leanne, Daniele, you have a question as well for Leanne? I do. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Leanne. That's very interesting. So uh, I was wondering, uh, well, I don't know how much data you have for that, but did you consider training a word embedding model to better visualize uh, which words are really grouped together? I beg your pardon? Uh, I was asking if you considered uh, training a word embedding model uh, with your data because um, through these models, you could better visualize uh, which words are in uh, clusters of semantic domains, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, you mean I, I can just try to use some other types of model to visualize my analysis, right? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Um, it is nice uh, in terms of visualization because it would also give you this uh, information about um, the, um, the frequencies, but also um, which, uh, in, a, in a sense, which words are considered similar for the model that is in, that are usually together in context a lot. So I think it's, it, it's very good to just um, correct or make my research better to have a chance to use some other tools like visualize the words frequency list maybe will be more clear right yeah i think it would yeah. be interesting like Daniel is suggesting yeah to group as well i mean it's such a big corpus and then if you were to group terms together there might be clearer trends emerging in the data or you might be able to see if this particular themes that emerge, you know, not just words in the frequencies, but also themes that emerge more broadly in your data as well. So there's lots to be said about that. But 
Look, it's almost um, time has run out for questions unless people have something else that they're dying to ask of Leanne. Otherwise, we say thank you to you, Leanne, for this uh, presentation. And uh, it's very interesting. And to all of our speakers as well, to Danieli and also to Jonas for this um, third session for us today. I think we're taking a 15-minute break now, and then we'll come back uh, in uh, a little while for a final paper from me. And then um, Katrina will wrap up with some final comments as well. So we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Sub variety of romance. Uh, some people have called this kind of variety a Sorite's paradox. In other words, if you just keep putting um, grains of sand onto a heap, obviously, if you put two or three, you would not consider it a heap. Um, but at some point, it does go to a kind of a heap of sand. So it's difficult to know when that happens. We can think of the same thing with language if we think about how many historical documents do we need to be able to testify to an original language. Some people think it's the same thing as going bold. You never completely use your hair, or some people do, but I've been losing two or three strands a day, it feels like, but at some point you become bold as well. So it's difficult to know at what point you make these decisions. So this is a language that is not easily tangible, that's been described um, throughout the history of its study and analysis. It's a kind of myth almost, a language that's con uh, constantly constructed and deconstructed. And researchers either create big corpora and highly inflated corpora like in Rossetti's corpus. Otherwise they deconstruct the notion of lingua franca and question its very entity. So we can either you know, go looking for evidence of it and create it, recreate it anachronistically, or we can um, disregard its existence altogether. So 
I've been trying to build the digital bibliography of documents uh, in which this language purportedly has been um, written and is attested in. Here's a list that I'm not expecting you to read at all, but it just kind of shows how um, you can see the first year is in 1204 and the last line in this uh, list shows uh, 1887, a document that was written in 1887. And you can see that I've color coded them according to um, centuries. So the light, the green bit at the top is, are two documents from the 14th century, then the 15th century, and then the 16th. And so the corpus seems to build and become ever more inflated as time goes on. In some cases, we only have one sentence in lingua franca. Um, and in other cases, we have the most authoritative source of lingua franca um, textual data, which is a dictionary that was written by an anonymous person in Marseille in the south of France in 1760. Um, you can access the dictionary online. It's been digitized through Gallica. Here's the front page of it. Um, it was written during the eight Regency of Algiers. And it was really one of the first documents that was used by a pioneering linguist in a study on lingua franca in 1909 um, that, so to speak, called to life uh, this particular language in Creole study, pidgin and Creole studies. So you can see uh, the dictionary is not really a dictionary in the sense that it doesn't give definitions, but it gives one-to-one -one mappings with French uh, lexemes on the left, and then the lingua franca variety in the right-hand column here. This is page uh, 31. And in total, there are 2,121 entries. Some of these are doubled up. So there's actually only 1,834 unique lexical items. But many of these items are formed by derivational morphology. And so you can see here, we have words like fumar and fumo, an infinitive to smoke and ice smoke. But these are much different from Italian fumare and fumo or French fume and fume. So this has been called um, a, a separate kind of language in a way. But as um, Jonathan Caston retweeted uh, Lee Wei's um, keynote, that it highlights the significance of naming languages as an important social act. So whether this language actually exists or not is kind of up for debate. Obviously, this dictionary was written during the time of the French Revolution or just after the French Revolution and the forming of the nation. And so one problem was how to reduce heterogeneity and assign lingua franca forms to standard languages. In some sense, we have lingua franca phenomena um, that can be clearly kind of assigned to particular varieties of romance and others that aren't. It's really a composite language in the sense that we have standard languages that have been identified in textual data from lingua franca, including this impressive list in the left, Arabic, Turkish, Spanish, Portuguese, Provençal, Catalan, Latinisms, Luso-Arabic, Greek, and French. And you can see some examples with English translations in the second column as well. Um, some researchers have recently tried to identify which of these words are Spanish and which are Italian and which are, you know, what, what kind of words are they? Where have they come from? Um, this person, Opperstein, in 2017, identified 52 words, which she says are from Italian origin. But as you can see, the, um, the orthography could leave itself open to any number of romance um, varieties, really, because we're talking about words like mi, ti, noi, albero. Um, but this is the kind of list that she's come up with. So my task in the past few months has been to try to create a digital database of the lexical entries in the dictionnaire and also mapping the places according to previous researchers where lingua franca has been attested. So I've been doing this in a software called Recogito using named um, uh, entity recognition and that's worked quite well. You can see here if you click on Brussels for example we can see that a particular um, the title of the document and we can see the author of the document as well and when it was written. And in general, we have a kind of a good geographical spread and it gives a much better visualization of how this particular language traveled around the Mediterranean and around Western Europe. 
Um, so it's a kind of code intermediate language, but in order to create a, um, a digital representation of these forms, it's kind of had to separate out the various codes because it's kind of going back to what Quinn was saying this morning in her keynote, how we don't necessarily have um, groups of scholars working on multiple problems, but rather um, smaller groups of uh, languages and only certain languages that are well resourced. So in these case, in this particular example, that has meant identifying not just what this word uh, means, but also dividing the lexical root up into the English word for smoke, defining it as an infinitive, and then tagging the latter part, the morphological ending as either a verb or a first person singular or whatever. So really the, the main theoretical question that I have about this research is how best to represent words that don't neatly fit into categories. And the main conclusion from today is that these categories are often standard languages like French, Italian, English, but it's not kind of obvious what we do with um, data that doesn't fit into any one of these categories quite neatly. So I'll leave it there and thanks. Thank you, Josh. It's really interesting. And, and interesting, you know, I've seen that project develop a bit with, um, you know, recommending Recogito. And so it's great to see it sort of moving along. Um, yeah, so yeah, we've certainly got time for some questions. So um, you can put your hand up or, or pop it in the chat um, if you've got questions for Josh. Always happy to ask the questions. To yeah, I mean, much of, much of the development and the software has been on your um, your good suggestions, Katrina, and your initiatives. So thank you so much for helping in designing it. Yeah, no, well, Recogito in particular is interesting because it's useful across quite a range of disciplines. So I think it's one of those interesting tools. Um, but yeah, I can see David's got his hand up. So I'll, I'll let him ask the question. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so would you say that this uh, language was a Creole? And uh, I suppose people who study Creoles, typically their languages uh, that they know from spoken, like their, their modern spoken languages. So you're looking at an historical Creole with only attested in written documents of some time ago. And that's the difficulty, would you put it that way? Yeah, I think that's exactly right, David. I mean, it's a it's an interesting question because other researchers have tried to assess whether the language, uh, you know, ever creolized and arrived at a stable natural state, and the answer has essentially been no, partly because it never um, belonged to any one particular ethnic group. It wasn't um, born during colonization, you know, in any particular circumstance, but you know, it's still a hybrid or a kind of mixed language. Uh, it does have a very systematized and simplified grammar and um, eliminates irregularities, for example, in the conjugation of otherwise irregular verbs. Um, but I've just written a paper on this language to, to kind of fall into the camp that says, I to agree with the previous scholarship using data from Lingua Franca to say that it, it hasn't really creolized because um, much of what we can ascertain in the language really just conforms to standard Italian. Um, as others researchers have said, it, it has a kind of Italian base. And so there might be some lexical interference, some borrowings from other languages, like we saw that list there. But um, that the morphology, for example, that, that we can describe in lingua franca isn't really anything separate from Italian. Um, so I don't think that you know, in a way that we might expect, for example, of um, you know, the way that the term Creole has been used by contemporary linguists. Um, so I don't think really that it's a, a term that, you know, whether that be kind of Creoles based on Arabic or Chinese or Malay, these are, these are you know, Portuguese and Malay as well are kind of the main Creoles that we think of in contact situations when we think of contact languages. But uh, this to me seems like a simplified orthography for writing standard Italian. So I don't know if that answers. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's, that's really quite different from uh, uh, what I was suggesting. So I, I was only doing that as trying to understand what you were saying. So that, um, yes, so 
that is a challenge for you uh, to do as a, a lexicographer, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, we've, an article has just come out trying to identify each term that's listed in this dictionary um, and to kind of trace it back etymologically, so to speak, to another standard variety. But again, for me, it's, a, it's really a, you know, and that's a kind of a useful taxonomy, I think, in terms of being able to explain um, the spread of lingua franca and the kinds of documents that it was used in. But I, I think that's kind of a far cry from saying that it's really a separate sub variety of romance. Um, and, you know, also comport has other implications as well in terms of how we might then represent the data uh, on, in, in a digital context. Do you think there's a kind of risk of, how would you put this, like fixing the language? I mean, this is often a problem with, with digital projects or digital methods that we, we rely so much on categorization and standardization to, to allow the, to anthropomorphize the computer, but to allow the computer to do its work. We, we have to sort of break, you know, categorize and, and turn things into data sets, which can sometimes make things seem distinct when in fact they're fuzzy. And often writing about fuzziness is very easy in an in traditional scholarship, which is written, but very difficult in a data set. That's it. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Katrina, in a sense, because that's the precisely the problem that I'm facing in trying to, um, I mean, the computer has to assign one value to you know, a particular lexeme or particular part of a lexeme, say. So you can't really tell it that, you know, this is a mixed variety or this particular part of the lexeme is, you know, could belong to multiple varieties. So in that sense, any model or any, for me, kind of any digital model that I'm making of this language uh, is a kind of simplification perforce, but it has to be if you want to create a database of, I mean, you could say the same thing about any model in social sciences, I guess, in a way, because you have to make some assumptions to move forward um, and to be able to put things online. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, like you're saying, there's a real risk of kind of oversimplifying it to the point where you fix it, and then it doesn't really become realistic or a useful model either, you know? Mm -hmm. So my hope is that you know, in creating the database, people will be able to use it to search for terms in um, lingua franca or in other romance languages, and then be able to assess whether these documents um, contain, you know, writing in those in those languages. Um, but that's the that's the problem, I guess, and the advantage of having a corpus like this, right? Like you'll be able to do that, but you're always conscious of the limitations of the corpus that you're creating. Hmm. And it's not necessarily of your own doing, but it's what the computer allows you to do, essentially. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, a fine line to walk, I think. But, but interesting, I think. You can, I mean, like, you can sometimes throw up these challenges as um, the problems with sort of digital methodologies, but I think often they're also the thing that makes it a really interesting area to work in because you're you're required to kind of ask those questions and to think kind of critically about how you create create data, which I think is the the strengths of digital humanities. Um, yeah, okay, Simon. Thanks, Josh. This is really fascinating. Um, what I wanted to comment on is that uh, it's really it's great that you acknowledge that Malay is a relevant case to compare with, and this is a current problem for people working in, certainly in Indonesian linguistics, um, trying to figure out when you see something, whether it's arrived in a language by inheritance or by borrowing because all the languages we're looking at essentially are Austronesian languages. They all share common ancestors by and large, apart from the odd language that started in New Guinea. And then Malays spread everywhere. And there's, there's stuff that's cognate, but how did it get there in that particular form? 
and people are working on this problem all the time in that field. So yeah, it's great to, to know that it's you're aware of those comparisons. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for those kind. That's very helpful. Yeah, I mean, I was just kind of quoting Malay as, you know, as a case study, I guess, of a classic pigeon situation. And I'm not sure exactly which variety Li Wei was talking about, you know, from um, University College London when he made that comment about how all languages, French, Italian, Chinese, whatever, are mixed languages. But obviously the problem is acute when it comes to a language like Malay that people might describe or think of as being a heterogeneous, you know, even Italian, as a heterogeneous entity. But in actual fact, if we dig a bit, they're not. So how do you, so that, that's kind of one problem in historical linguistics, say, like, you're, you know, is it inherited or is it transferred? But the other problem is how can we tell the computer that? Or how can we transfer that information, the kind of metadata information, so that the computer is aware of it, so that researchers don't you know, come to wrong conclusions if they're looking for, you know, words that are inherited or whatever. So that's useful to have your comments about Malay, actually. Thank you. Um, I think it's five past, Katrina. Should yeah. we? Well, yeah. So, yeah, we can um, wrap up. Yeah, it's a short final session, um, the way these things can turn out with, with planning. So, yeah, I think all um, all that remains at this point was just to sort of wrap up from the day. So yeah, thank as I, I've already said, thank you to everyone for their papers, people present and and who've had to go go off to bed. Uh, so thank you very much. It's been a really fascinating discussion, and I think like so many uh, topics within talking about digital methodologies and digital humanities, there's such a range. Even even when you try and narrow it down to something like like language and, and multilingualism, you still end up with with such a diversity of, of topic topics and problems. And I think it's been really generous of people to talk to some of the problems with the challenges in this research that it's it's always a, a slightly exposing thing as a researcher to, to get up and say, you know, I did this and it's it's not gone quite as I planned or I haven't done as much or it hasn't, hasn't gone as well as I expected at all, which is, um, you know, a reality of doing research um, using these new and emerging methodologies. It's, and I think it's really important to, to have these forums where we can, we can talk about that and share those experiences. So, um, yeah, I think there was, I was sort of trying to track some themes over the day, and, and I think there were obvious ones, but that was also tricky because there was a lot of diversity, but there was, um, I thought that we, we were, it was good to start off early with the discussion of infrastructure and, and, and data, because I think that underlies so much of um, then thinking of um, Jonas's paper in the last session, that there's, there's so much of what we're able to do is not just about the conceptualization of a project, or um, it's also about whether we have the data, whether the infrastructure exists. And that, that will really affect not um, you know what we can do and the you know the extent to which we we can undertake it. And so I think recognizing that um, the importance of that slow scholarship to establish both the slowness often in the establishment of infrastructure, which can take a, you know quite a long time to to establish in the humanities, but also that's that slowness and those steps of, of important initial steps to be taken in establishing you know areas of research where there really hasn't been much much work done and to, to give to you know to give ourselves and our colleagues the space to do that that research and not to expect you know as often seems in academia these days for everything to be very fast and um you know they're very productive even though you know of course it is productive work but it often slower and at a smaller scale than we'd hoped for um yeah and i think the other uh, sort of key thing was just, and I, hopefully we've offered something of this, but it's just the importance of these communities of scholarship and the way that, you know, you can need to reach out to people with expertise in, in the use of the, the tools or the methods or people with expertise and background in the particular discipline or the language that you're working in. And I think navigating that um, community is often something that, that has to be done you know, project by project, working out who 
who it is you need to bring in and, and to engage and something like that. So yeah, I think I won't, um, <laughs> I think everyone's expressed their ideas very clearly today and it's been enjoyable. So I won't, I won't spend any more time wrapping up, but yeah, just to say thank you very much for your contributions. And um, I think Josh and I, we've been um, messaging each other saying how valuable we found the discussion. So I hope everyone else also has. And yeah, did you have any final words, Josh? I don't think so. Just to just to say thank you to everybody for their participation and for their uh, sharing their research as well. And the, like you say, it's not easy to talk about um, problems and give some context in a 10 minute talk and then have 10 minutes for questions either. But I've found the, the whole day very useful and particularly um, particularly good to see kind of the diversity, I think, in multilingual digital humanities. Like we really threw the wide net, I think, in terms of thinking about different tools and methodologies that people are using in contexts um, outside of English. And so, you know, I think uh, this will spur people on to think more about what are the shared issues that we have and what are the, what are the problems that we can deal with together to, to help pushing the, the research forward. So thanks to everybody for sticking around for the whole day and uh, and we'll be in touch as well. And a huge thank you to Katrina and Josh for organising the event. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Simon. That's very kind of you thank to say. You. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody for their talk. So it was it was a great day. Okay. We'll see you.